Chapter 11, Processes and Services. This week, we get into one of the most common system administration tasks, and that is managing what, what's running on any of our servers. It's a, actually kind of a big deal. We're going to start by defining what a process even is, right? What, what, what is this thing? Well, we'll find out. We'll learn how to uh, manipulate them, how to schedule them, and we'll look at this from not just Windows, but from a Linux perspective also. All operating systems do this. They all have processes. Uh, the way they manage them is slightly different, but the idea is the same. So we're going to go, we're going to look at all that. So the basic fundamental question here, what is a process? A process is just a fancy word for a program, right? A piece of code that runs. Now this could be something that I start, or you start, as a human being, you double click on a little icon, you know, I want to play Call of Duty 47, so I double click on the, on the desktop icon and it starts the program. Well, I'm starting the Call of Duty 47 process. They can also be started by other programs, right? Programs can start other programs. It's actually how your system boots, that's really what's going on there. Well, there's different kinds of processes. In the case of a process starting another process, the one that did the starting is the parent process. The one that got started was the child process. Okay, that makes sense. And this can go many generations. The children can have children, and the children can have children, and altogether that's what's known as a process tree. Okay. Now, unlike the, the human analogy, uh, which kind of breaks down at this point, because, uh, you know, my father had me, I had my kids, someday they'll have kids. Processes, the, ch the child processes, don't outlive the parent process. Meaning, even though it was the first process started, the parent process, ideally, is, should be the last one that stops. Well, it doesn't always happen that way. Uh, sometimes you can have the parent process will, will shut down, it'll crash. Or somebody, or somebody goes out and deliberately kills it. The child is then known as an orphan, right? Orphan processes are something that you need to take, be looking out for as an admin. They're using up your system resources and are very likely not doing anything. Another kind, and uh, this kind of sounds like a, a, a TV show off of A&E, are zombie processes. This is a process that is still running, but it's, it's crashed in some way. It's malfunctioned. It's walking around, you know, it's the walking dead thing going around. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing, but it's still consuming your system resources. And you have to hunt those also. These orphans and zombies, they consume your ever so valuable system resources. So that's part of our jobs as admins is to take care of these. Now processes can be in two states really, uh, other than on or off. Uh, they can be in the foreground which means you're interacting with it. You're sitting there and you are playing Call of Duty 47 actively. Or it's going in the background, like most of the processes that make up your, your Windows operating system or your Linux operating system. We don't even see them. We're not even aware they're going on, but they're programs that are running that are keeping the, the OS up and going. So those are background processes. The process's status, well, that's just information about its state. Right? How many resources is it consuming? How much RAM? How much CPU? What kind of disk activity? Uh, what's its PID? Hmm, that could be interesting. Well, that is. Every process on a system has a PID, a process ID, a process identifier. Right? The system doesn't know that the Apache web server process is an Apache web server. All it knows is that it's process 5612. Well, that's its PID. And when we're talking to the system, many times we need to know what that PID is. We'll see here in a little bit how you can actually see what that looks like. So how do you manage them? What's, uh, what, 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 what's going on here? Under Windows, it's not that big of a deal. I'm sure everyone's used Task Manager, right? Something, I'm playing Call of Duty 47 and it hangs up. Oh no, great, I didn't even save my score. Well short of rebooting my system, which sometimes we have to do, if I can get Task Manager up, I can probably go in and kill that process. Well, this is actually a bit of a dated slide. And Task Manager is updated a bit under Windows 10. Uh, that's what I'm running on this system that we're filming this on. And even though it's changed a little bit, it's still the same idea. Right? You can list your processes. 
we can look at our performance. Now, let's say I'm going to pick something like, well, Camtasia. That's what we use to film this, uh, to, to film these videos. So I'm going to click on that, and I want to look in and I want to see what that's doing to my to my CPU to my resources. See, I'm cranking away here. I'm using 11% of my CPU process. I'm using four and a half gig of my 16 gig of RAM, and so forth. I can go back to here, and from here is where we can also manipulate processes. So, for example, I have Chrome right here. If I wanted to, to do something with it, I could right-click on it. And one thing I can do is end task. I click on that, I will kill that process. It will shut down and release those resources back to the operating system. That happens quite a bit. That's what you do when Call of Duty 47 crashes on you. I can also do something like this, though. Look at properties. Actually, this is always in the foreground, so let's get that out of the way. It opens up this little dialog, and it tells me a little bit about the process, uh, when it started running, where it lives, and so forth. Compatibility mode, specific details about it. So, pretty good stuff. With, with um, Task Manager, we can do quite a bit on, on, our, on our Windows systems processes hang or if we see somebody over here taking it up you know 90 percent of CPU or 90 percent of RAM well I can go in find that process and kill it all right great what about what about Linux what does it look like there well Linux being a being a primary command line interface it has something similar it has something called the top command and it looks sort of like that same idea as we saw under Task Manager. See all your processes being listed there, talking about what the actual command was that fired it up, uh, the process ID, that PID, right there, left-hand column, tells me about if I have any zombies going. So a really useful little tool under, under Linux. Other processes I have under Linux, too, is if, let's say, there was a process I need to get rid of. I'm not going to kill any processes here because I don't want to crash my uh, little Linux server I'm connected to. But see that, see those PIDs? Let's say I wanted to kill, oh, my NTP cl uh, client right here, network network time protocol. Kill one eight three three. Hit enter, shuts that process down. Cool. All right, well, we talked about starting processes and stopping them manually, right? It's not too bad. You've, even under, under Windows, you just double-click an icon and off it goes. Well, here's the thing. A lot of processes need to be started at times that aren't convenient for us. Maybe you've got a backup that needs to run every night at 2, 2.45 in the morning. Well, I don't want to have to get up every night at 2.45 in the morning, and I'm sure you don't either, to log into the server and fire that backup off. There's got to be a better way. And, well, there is. Uh, we can schedule processes. Operating systems also have tools that allow us to do this. Under Windows, it's called a task scheduler. And actually, let's look at the real thing. Under Windows 10, it looks something kind of like this. So, different categories of stuff here off to the left. And this is just an example. These are tasks that were set up by my Windows 10 system. As you can see, it does. It's pretty busy. It does all kinds of stuff. If I want to look at my RoboForm icon, that does something at a certain time. You can look at the triggers, what sets it off, what it actually does. Up, oh, it actually starts this program right here. And these are the system ones, but you can add your own. I mean, some of these were installed by hardware or software when I installed different programs. Maybe you want it, your system to you know, run an antivirus or run a backup in the middle of the night. Maybe I want to update my Garmin, right? At 2 a.m. every day, this little Garmin updater program goes out and looks to see if my GPS has any updates. So, totally useful. Very nice. Linux doesn't leave us high and dry on this either. Oops. Now, under Linux, it takes a slightly different approach to it. There's actually two different programs you can use for this. One of them 
It's called the at command. And that's, I use at, and literally it is at, like so, to run a process one time. Maybe this isn't a reoccurring thing. Maybe this is something I'm going to do it once and that's it. I'm going to copy the contents of my home directory to a thumb drive at 2.30 this morning. And that's the only time I'm ever going to do it. Well, I can use the at command to do that. It's perfect for that. It does it one time and you're done. For reoccurring stuff, the service under Linux is called cron. And this is analogous to the Windows uh, task scheduler. Same idea. Let's say we wanted to see what that looked like, though. Well, it uses something called a cron tab, and it uses this particular format, which we're not going to spend much time on. I mean, this is this this is for uh, CMIT 120, but I can specify minutes, hours, day of the month, the month, the day of the week, and for a for a for a process to be run, and the system will continue to do it. So we've been talking about processes. What about services? That's the second half of this chapter, the second name of it. What's going on with that? Well, services are processes, right? That's really what they are. But they're def rather than just something that we start, they're, they're software that runs in the background that performs some function. And look, we get little examples here. Maybe I have a DNS client, domain name service client. Well, you do. Uh, pretty much on any on any desktop system, and that's always running in the background. So when I type in www.yahoo.com, that's the service that goes out and resolves it to an IP address. Likewise, all my machines, yours too probably, are dynamic um, uh, dynamic IP use a dynamic IP addressing DHCP dynamic host control protocol. So there's a client on there that runs in the background as a service. Linux has them too, except they call them daemons. And we'll, we'll look at that just a bit. How do I manage services? Well, this is another common thing. In addition to just the processes that get started and going, controlling what services start, stop, or are running on your system is kind of important. Well, under Windows, and when I show you these Windows screens, these are like screenshots on the slides off a Windows 7 machine. I'm showing you actual examples from a Windows 10 machine. But this is the same on the server. Right? If you're on a Windows Server 2008 R2 or Windows Server 2012 R2, you're going to see the same, the same screens, the same ideas hold. Well, the Services Console looks a lot like this. Right? Here up to the left are the actual services that are loaded onto the system. And on a Windows system, you can see there's quite a bit of stuff going on here. Everything from my mouse service, an iPod service. Yeah, I have iTunes installed on here. All kinds of stuff. Center column gives you a little description. What is it? Right? What, what, what is this thing? What is the NTI I schedule SVC? Well, this is a little description that talks about what it is. And then you have this column here for status. Is the service running or is it not? And then you have a startup type. What is the system supposed to do with this service when the system boots. Does it automatically start it? Like we like the service accounts manager we have right here? Does it do a delayed start? Like on our security center? Or is it manual? Is it something that has to be started by a user or another process? Or is it disabled completely? Like do not start this no matter what. We can go in and totally set these. And this is the kind of stuff that we do as admins. This remote registry service, and I'll be honest, I don't really know what this what, what this is. Uh, it looks like some kind of Windows 10 thing. Right now, is in a disabled state, but I could turn around and say, make it manual, make it automatic, give it a, a delayed start. What that means is, start the system, let it run for X amount of time, then start the process. Let or the service, let other services come up first. If I were to set it to manual and hit apply. So let's go ahead and do that. Now I have a start button that comes up. I can start the service. Once it's started, I can stop it, I can suspend it, and I can I can start it back up again. Actually, I'm going to put that back to disabled. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is that services, like processes, have dependencies. Which that means is some some services need other services to be running in order for them to run. 
and right here, this little remote registry service requires the the RPC call service to be running. As an example, so we talked about services. We talked about we talked about processes. We're going to take a, a look at a slightly different topic here. We're going to look at system logging. All right? What it, what what is it, and why do we care? I'll tell you something. As admins, we really like the fact that our systems log. Right? If you don't like sitting on a console 24-7 trying to keep track of what's happening, the system log is what you need. Again, all major operating systems have these. They have different implementations of them. And we'll just briefly look at a couple of them here. Let's say that you're the administrator for a, a public-facing web server for some online company, right? some, some e-commerce site. It's running Linux, and it's running Apache as a web server. And your customer calls you, and they said, hey, um, we're getting complaints from customers that every morning at 2.30 in the morning, the system get, the website gets really, really slow for about a half hour, and then it gets fast again. Can, do you know what's going on with that? Well, if you didn't have the ability to log what, do system logging, you would have to sit up there at 2.30 in the morning and watch it yourself. I don't want to be doing that. i got better things to be doing at 2.30 in the morning, may, may, namely sleeping. But the system log will catch it. So what you do as the admin is you log on to that server at any time of the day, go look at the system log, scroll back in time a little bit, and see what was happening at 2.30 in the morning. Maybe you'll see a log entry in there that says, oh, look at that, the backup service kicked off at 2.30. It took 25 minutes to run. There's your slowness. So at least now you know what's going on with it. System logging, kind of a big deal. Well, how does Windows do it? Like everything else, it does it through a console, right? An MMC console, Microsoft Management Console. Oops, that's Task Manager. We don't want that. There we go. And it uses something called the Event Viewer. That looks as the Event Viewer out of Windows 7 in the picture. Here's the Event Viewer out of Windows 10. Same kind of idea. Expand that out just a bit. Click on my Windows logs. Now there's lots and lots of logs on a Windows system. Okay, you've got application logs, you've got forwarded logs, all that. But really there's three primary ones at admins we care about. You've got what's called the system log, which is your main log for the system itself, what's happening with the operating system. You've got an, op an application log. This logs, this logs what happens to programs you're running. And then you have a security log, which talks about who logged in where. Right? Remember last week when we were talking about usernames and groups and all that kind of thing? Well, that's one of the reasons you want a multi-user operating system. People log in with their username and do things, and it'll show up in these logs, especially the security log. So then you can audit what they're doing. Totally useful. So let's look at our system log for a minute. And there's actually four levels of logging that we care about. We have everything from informational level, which is just an FYI, right? Here's one right here. It says the system uptime is 12,032 seconds. Cool. Excellent. Do I really care? No, it's just informational. FYI, nothing wrong, nothing to see here. Just thought you'd want to know. And then you have warning levels. Let's see if we can scroll down and find some. All right, let's sort by it then. More than one way to get around this. Oh, there we go. Oh, we're looking at some more critical errors here. Well, I, there we go. Warning. Warnings are that little yellow triangle there. What this is saying is something happened. Right? And like, for example, right here, the task scheduler had a, had a problem. Somewhere in some task definition, it didn't like what it saw. A warning is not the end of the world. It just means, hey, this didn't go according to plan. Uh, we're okay. Just letting you know it's a warning. So as admins, we kind of want to go out and look for those. If you see a bunch of warnings, <laughs> kind of like I see here, then it's the type of thing that you want to go out and figure out what's going on. Right? Another level is error. What that means is something has crashed. Something 
is not working the way we expected it to. So for example, here's an error. My system uh, got hard booted at 7.53 p.m. on the 6th of January. Well, that was an error message. It crashed the event log. And it just kind of went out there and it just logged it. It said, hey, so didn't expect that error, right? Errors are definitely something as an admin you're going to want to hunt down, especially on your production servers. And then we have critical. Critical means the system is down. The Titanic has hit the iceberg and sunk. Right? Hashtag OMG. Here, my system got uh, was hard booted, and it didn't like that at all. So it it, it it logged a critical error. If you're getting critical errors on your production systems, uh, you're probably noticing it in other ways. You probably have some other symptoms. Other columns here. Let's so let's go back and sort by our default one of date and time. Takes a second to sort. There we go. Our next column over, it tells us the date and the time the event was logged. <laughs> That's really good to know. We can't, we definitely want to know that, right? Hey, the server is slow at 2.30 in the morning. Well, that's how I find it. Then you have the source. And for our purposes right now, we'll just say that this is the process or the service that logged the error, right? We go more in that in other classes, but it's good enough for right now. And then probably our most important uh, column here, event ID. Right, like a process ID, the Windows the Windows Event Viewer assigns every single uh, event an ID number, numerical. Well, these event numbers are totally useful, right? Because let's just pick something here. All right, this process right here, the boot manager spent zero milliseconds waiting for user input. Okay, great, but it has an event ID of 32. Well, if I want to know more about this. I can put that in a Lugal. I can I can Lugal Windows Event ID 32, and I'll have dozens of hits pointing me to resources that that tell me about this. And I'm telling you, I can't. I, I I was an admin back before we had uh, the internet and Google, but I can't really remember how we did it. Because I mean, th this makes administration so much better. So our our event viewer. We have our four different levels of logging, and we have our event ID. Nice and important to remember. And that covers Windows. I am going to take a second and show you one more thing. If we go here and look at our Linux system. Now, I did tell you that Linux logs also, and it does, right? So if I go to a folder called var log, and we're going to see here, these are all, all the, the Linux system logs that are going on. Whereas the Windows primary log was, was the, the system log, the Linux primary log is called messages. Right there. And like the Windows event log, there it is. It'll break out the date and time something happened, the what logged it, and then a little description of what the logging event was. So you can see it's the, kind of the same thing, Whether you, no matter what operating system you're using, they just have different ways of doing it. And that, for us, is a wrap. So be sure to get in, do the discussion questions, submit any homework assignments, and I will see you next week.